life's experiences and how he had sought to live his life. And of course, he was anything but perfect. Remarkably, the Bible talks about him as being a man after God's own heart. And yet we know that he fell on so many uh, different occasions. It's just an amazing story, really, of, uh, of uh, David. But he said in verse 25 of Psalm 37, I was young, but now I'm old. I feel like that, actually. Perhaps many of you do as well. I was young, but now I'm old. But his testimony was this. Yet, I have never seen the righteous forsaken. I have never seen the righteous forsaken. God has never deserted those who are seeking to follow him in his ways. He's always a good God to us. He's always a God who wants our, uh, covers our backs, if I can put it that way. And David said this, Don't fret. Don't be full of envy. Don't get angry or annoyed when life appears to be good for those who are going their own way. When God seems distant from us, when life is tough going, don't get hot under the collar. And the word fret actually means to get heated or literally to get red in the face or to fume don't be worried or get depressed or discouraged or disillusioned or despondent or all the other disses you can think of when you're following God's ways. And yet people who are not following God's ways and are living a sinful life are apparently prospering and succeeding. And don't forget that he's not just talking about people who are getting away with wickedness and wrong and evil to quote the NIV, but sin is wherever we are disobedient to God's commands and God's word. And God's word says that we actually have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us as kin has reminded us this morning. What should we do? Well, we should try as far as we can to seek to follow God's ways and follow his word. Well, David's message is that when we seek to do that, to follow God's ways, then we are investing in eternity. And those who don't follow God's ways are like grass or green plants, it says in the NI version. They, they will wither and die away. There is a judgment. And that judgment will uh, condemn those who have turned their backs on God in the long term verses 9 and 10 says they will be cut off they will die away they will be no more you will look for them but you won't find them and what david is saying is this he's saying don't get angry about these folks who apparently succeed in their ways contrary to god's plans and purposes because their success is short-term temporary in the context of eternity their prosperity is momentary there is a judgment. And when you try to live your life for God, as Kevin made that decision, as God just through his Holy Spirit just spoke into his life, he's actually saying, I want to follow you, God. I'm going to try the best of my ability to do that. And what David is saying is, don't get angry about these folks. There is that judgment. When you try to live your life for God, the rewards are eternal, long-lasting, permanent, to be trusted. And in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, we read these familiar words. Do not store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Sorry, treasures on earth. <laughs> <laughs> Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal but stir up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also so those who choose God's way, those 
who hope in the Lord, verse 9. Those who are the meek, verse 11. In familiar Bible language, those are the people who will inherit the earth. Become kingdom people for all eternity. And the key is in that verse 11. The meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. Meekness is an interesting word. I don't know what it means to you what impression it gives you but it actually means gentleness but gentleness is not intended to convey weakness or timidity but it's actually a word where the origin of the word meekness is that it's immense strength and power under control if you think of a rodeo horse that's being broken in and you think of all the immense huge power and and strength that that horse has but when it's broken in it can be as gentle as anything that's what the word gentle actually means in its origin it's strength and power but under control Kev's a bit like that he's a street fighter you know he 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 just beat people up and worse but actually He's a gentle soul, despite the fact of that that background. He's a man under control. Walking in God's ways is walking in God's strength and God's power under his direction. It's the Holy Spirit within us, taming us, controlling us, but available to us if we trust him. And our reward is that we are an heir to the riches and the blessings of his kingdom. We will experience much blessing because we're on God's side and we know his strength and his power unlike those who are not on his side whose prospects will fade into nothing. And Jesus must have had this verse in mind when he taught the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. You recall Matthew 5 verse 5 Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth and that verse is a twin verse it's linked to Matthew 5 verse 3 blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven now what does that mean what does poor in spirit mean well being poor in spirit means to be humble and its root word is linked to the relationship between a slave and their master you see a slave is totally dependent upon their master. They have nothing except what their master gives them. Now apply that to our relationship with God. We are destitute. We are bankrupt of any capacity or capability in ourselves to pursue God's plans and purposes, to obey him, to live in his power and strength, to know salvation, to inherit eternal life, to inherit joy. Being poor in spirit in us means to be totally dependent upon God. We are spiritually impoverished, destitute without God. And the supreme example of that, amazingly, is not you and me, is Jesus. Hear what Jesus says in Matthew 11. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You heard those words before? I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, Jesus, this is the only place in Scripture that I can find where Jesus himself describes his character. There are lots of other people, instances of other people who describe what Jesus was like. But Jesus was saying, this is me. Learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart. Gentle means meek. Humble in heart means poor in spirit. The message translates that the verse is in red. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Let 
Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I love that. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Jesus only did what his father wanted him to do. He only did his father's will. Not his own, it says in scripture. So meek and humble followers of God will be blessed by God's grace flowing to and through them as their rhythm in life is to do what God wants them to do rather than to do their own thing. The meek and the humble will also see the justice of God demonstrated. The grace of God is seen in the lives of meek and humble followers of God and his justice is seen in the lives of those who seem to be prospering without him but who will experience God's judgment upon their lives eventually. So what a choice we have for God's ways or against his ways. Doing our own thing and our own strength or following God in his strength. Pursuing righteousness or unrighteousness. Being on God's side or pursuing our own ways. The latest book that I'm reading actually is a book by Jim Wallace and it's called On God's Side. And it's based on a quote from Abraham Lincoln so many years ago during the American Civil War. And people were saying to him, is God on our side? And Abraham Lincoln said, well, I'm not really interested in that. What I'm really interested in is whether I'm on God's side. And that's true for us as well, isn't it? Are we going to be on God's side or not on God's side? It's not whether he's on our side, it's whether we're on his. So what are the steps in these verses then to experiencing God's freely given grace? Don't fret, don't get angry, don't get steamed up about others and their apparent success without God. But David follows, says, follow these steps. This is what you should do. Firstly, he says in verse 3, trust in the Lord. And the overflow of that will be as you do good to all. The psalmist's language is dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. And you know, trust, being able to trust, being able to hand over your life to God is a challenging thing. It really is a challenging thing. Can we trust God? Can we trust God with our life? Can we trust God with our our wives and families? Can we trust God with our friends? Can we trust God with our finances and our work and whatever else? Is he reliable? Is he trustworthy? The answer is yes, yes, yes. He is totally faithful. He's totally trans trustworthy in all that he does. And then secondly, in verse 4, it says, when you trust God, when you think that he's trustworthy, then you will delight in him. And as you delight in him, he delights in you. It's amazing. You see, what follows trust and delight is that he gives us the desires of our hearts. And this is much, much, much misunderstood. It sounds like we have a blank check. I'm not allowed to talk about checks these days. I've, I haven't seen a check for years. <laughs> anyway, you know what I mean when I say a blank check. Sounds like a blank check, but it means that as we trust and delight in him, so our desires become amazingly aligned with his desires, and we want to please him in every way, and our desires are in line with his, and our will is in line with his will and so our desires somehow become a reflection of his desires for us and then in verse 5 and 6 as we trust in God and as we delight in him and as we please him so we commit our way to him and as we commit our every act and thought to him then he will show us how blessed we are 
whatever happens to those who don't follow him. We will see God's blessing into all eternity in our lives. The meek submit to the will of God and are totally dependent upon him. And the word commit means to roll over onto. That's what the word commit, actually it's the root of the word commit, to roll onto. And just as in Matthew 11 we read, we invite Jesus to bear our burdens and to the weight of life's challenges and all the challenges we have in life, we are rolling our burdens onto him and to his shoulders. And his yoke is easy and light. We leave our lives in his hands for all eternity. And then in verse 7, as we live our lives for him, we need to be still and patient, waiting for the fulfillment of his plans and his purposes for us. Verse 10 says that in a little while you will see that he is a just and a fair God. We will see his salvation and the wicked will see his justice. And then jumping to the last verses in Psalm 37, we read this. I have seen a wicked and ruthless man flourishing like the luxuriant native tree, but he soon passed away and was no more. Though I looked for him, he could not be found. Consider the blameless, the upright. A future awaits those who seek peace. But all sinners will be destroyed. They will be no, there will be no future for the wicked. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Are we on God's side or not? Are we rooting for him or not? Are we following his ways or not? Are we following righteousness or unrighteousness? Are we seeking to place ourselves in his hands or do our own thing? What a challenge. What an amazing inheritance awaits us as we make that decision, as we follow God. But there is a choice to be made, to follow or not to follow God. And this psalm invites us to trust in God, to delight in him, to commit our way to him, to wait patiently for him in meekness and in humility become more and more like Jesus. We're not the finished article. I'm not the finished article. Kevin is not the finished article. None of us are the finished article. We're works in progress. But that's our desire. Through good times and not so good times. Not diverted by the apparent but temporary success of those who are not following God, but longing to see the salvation of God and eternal life, longing to see Jesus come back again, longing to spend eternity with him. And it starts now as we follow him. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for the amazing way in which you guide and protect us as we walk our daily lives in you. Thank you, Lord God, that we can say that you are trustworthy. Thank you that we can delight in you. Thank you that we can commit our way to you. Thank you that we can wait patiently for these things to happen. But we have that assurance that it's amazing to be on your side. It's the only place to be. And so we thank you, Lord God, for this psalm. We thank you for the experience of David. Thank you that uh, he was able to say that the righteous have never been let down, that you've always fulfilled your promises. And we thank you that you fulfilled your promises for us. Thank you that you've fulfilled your promises for each one of us here. Thank you that you have for Kevin and for everyone else. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Mm -hmm.